Hello everyone and welcome to our eLotus webinar today. My name is Donna and I will be your host and your moderator. For over two decades, eLotus has been your trusted source for TCM continuing education for acupuncturists. We offer the largest selection of online CE courses with over 3,000 CE hours. And if you are new to eLotus, we have a special gift for you. All new members receive a free one CEU course as a welcome gift, and this offer is valid for new accounts only. Also, can you believe it? We're so excited to tell you that this webinar, this webinar today is Dr. Chen's intro to Chinese Herbal Medicine series. We now have the full series up on YouTube as well as elotus.org. Plus, if you're interested in earning CEUs for this series, we actually have the class on sale after this class is over and it would be for 13 CEUs. Just remember to carefully read on which board has currently approved of this. Okay, that takes care of everything today. Here's a quick introduction of Dr. John Chen. Dr. Chen is a recognized authority in both Western pharmacology and Chinese herbal medicine and is the lead author for the Chinese medical herbology and pharmacology. Chinese Herbal Formulas and Applications, and Chinese Herbal Formulas for Veterinarians. To learn more about all the herbs he will be talking about today and also and throughout his series, you can get his books at www.evherbs.com. All right, guys, let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Chen. Hello everyone, uh, let me do a quick audio and video check. So if you can, please let Donna know whether uh, you can hear me or not before I go ahead and start. All right, looks like we're good. All right, so um, I'm glad we have come to the end of this series of lecture on Introduction to Chinese Civil Medicine. Um, so over the last 14, 15 hours or so, we have gone through many different chapters of individual herbs and also herbal formulas. Uh, so if you are a student or a new practitioner, I hope that was a good introduction for you. And if you are a seasoned practitioner, um, I hope that was a good review for you. And I hope the classes you know, uh, were able to teach you something that you didn't know before and maybe give you a little bit of renewed vigor uh, to mm -hmm. practice herbs and see patients, okay? And um, I'll stray away from the topic for just a bit, but I think this is important, and that is, uh, let me take a moment and tell you what I think is a secret to having a successful practice. And it's interesting because the word doctor actually has a word origin that means teacher. Okay, so it, it is implying that we as doctors, as healthcare practitioners, are supposed to be teachers that teach the patients in addition to treating the patients. But in a way, I strongly disagree. And the reason is because if you think about it, uh, placebos inherently has about a 50% success rate. Uh, if you are a new practitioner that just graduated from school, your success rate may be about 60% or so. If you are into your five or 10 year period, then your success rate may be up to about 70%. And if you are really good, you work really hard, you study really hard, you have good intuition, then uh, if you get to the expert level, I think if you have a 90% success rate, that is really excellent, all right? But nowhere are we ever gonna get close to 100%, all right? So in a way, um, to call ourselves teachers, I think uh, it's, not all, it's not entirely correct. I rather think of ourselves as students, okay? And the reason is because for every patient that comes in, for every case that we encounter, there is so much we can learn from the patient. There is so much we can learn from the case, okay? So if you approach yourself as a student, that's always hungry and humble to learn, I think that's the only way that we can continue to get better each and every day with each and every patient, all right? So if this is a patient, this is a case that you're already familiar with, then the challenge would be try to get a higher success rate in treating this patient. 
or faster response rate. And if this is a patient or this is a case that you're not familiar with, then use this as a great learning opportunity to educate yourself to get better. All right, so I think it's very important for us to always stay hungry and always stay humble. Uh, we need to stay hungry so we will always continue to learn and recognize that there is far more that we don't know than what we do know. And we also need to stay humble because once we are no longer humble, once we have certain arrogance, then that's going to be our blind spot. We are not going to be able to see what we don't see and learn what we don't know. Okay, so always be humble. Always realize that we ca there's always room for improvement. There's always room to get better. All right. So always remember, you know, um, doctor is not necessarily a teacher, but think of it as doctor as always a student. All right. So that I think is a secret to having a successful practice and becoming a successful practitioner. All right. So that aside, uh, we spent, like I mentioned, the last um, 14 hours or so going through many different chapters of single herb, many different chapters of herbal formulas. Uh, we learned mostly about what to do, how to treat the patient, and so on. Okay, so today, as a summary, uh, we'll take a little, di little bit different perspective. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about safety issues, toxicity issues, uh, learn about what not to do, or perhaps when not to treat the patients. So this is more from a safety perspective, from a management perspective. Okay, so I think that's also important uh, in your practice. All right, so these are some of the main topics that I will be going over. Um, a lot of these are issues that we ha have already touched up on uh, in uh, the last 14 weeks or so. Um, I'll go into a little bit more depth or provide a little bit more information uh, for these topics. All right. I think pregnancy and nursing, first of all, uh, is always going to be a challenging issue. Uh, it's not that we don't have information. It's not that we cannot treat these patients, but really it's the legal liability here in this country. Uh, so what happened is anytime you treat somebody during pregnancy and nursing, uh, it's not just the effect that you have to watch out for, it's also the side effect and also the unknown. Okay, so um, yeah, please ex exercise extra caution anytime you treat somebody who is pregnant or who is nursing. Okay, and I have gone through a lot of traditional literature and also contemporary literature basically to uh, put together a list of herbs that are contraindicated and also to be used with caution. Okay, so. Um, I put them all together so you can have it all in one place. Um, the PowerPoint may be a bit um, small or crowded. Uh, here is another view. And in fact, this is probably a much better view. It lists all the herbs in alphabetical order and also the reason in for which they are contraindicated, either because of them inherently designated as a quote-unquote toxic herb. So toxic in this case simply means they are more likely to cause adverse reaction and side effect. Okay, so the old TCM material medica tends to lump all those reasons uh, into one, into a category of toxic. So if you not, if you remember, right, the herbs can be designated as slightly toxic, toxic, or extremely toxic. So these are the ones uh, that are designated as toxic and therefore should not be used during pregnancy. And then specifically, some herbs have downward draining effect, some have stimulant effect on the uterus, and some are known to cause, um, to terminate pregnancy. All right, so uh, these are the specific reason or the effect of the herb that cause them to be contraindicated during pregnancy. And the last is herbs that have been shown to have teratogenic effect, so mostly toxic effect to the fetus, all right? In any case, regardless of what the reason may be, um, I would say in the U.S., under the current liability environment, these are the herbs that you really should stay away no matter what the benefit may be in using these herbs during pregnancy. I think the risk is simply too great, all right? These are then the herbs um, that should be used with caution. And what that means is uh, if there is a significant reason why the use of herb may be needed, okay, and if the benefit is significantly greater than the risk, then these are the herbs that you may consider to proceed as long as the risk is manageable and justified. 
So for example, uh, the second herb on here is ban xia, rhizoma panelia. If you use this herb as a raw herb that's not properly processed, obviously it can be toxic. But if you use it as a processed herb, whether it's ginger process or otherwise, and it does have a great effect to help, especially to treat morning sickness, nausea, vomiting, and so on during pregnancy. Okay, so it does have a place during pregnancy, but only when the benefit is greater than the risk. Okay, so that same rationale applies to most of the other herbs within this overhead. Okay, so generally speaking, you should caution, try to avoid it if, if at all possible. But under certain circumstances, um, it's fine to use these herbs. And then in, con in contrary, these are the herbs specifically that offer beneficial effect. And in fact, are frequently used. Uh, most of these herbs the herbs that will help to strengthen the digestive system, tonify qi, stabilize pregnancy, relieve low back pain, and so on. All right, so these herbs, generally speaking, you can use with 100% confidence that they will not harm, harm the mother or the fetus. Okay, in fact, there's also a formula uh, specifically to be used during pregnancy called Bao Chan Wu You Fang. And literal name of this formula is to preserve pregnancy worry-free formula. And this is a formula specifically to be used during pregnancy to prevent miscarriage. All right, so in that case, if you, and we, and we actually encounter this quite a bit, what happened is a lot of the women in Europe and U.S., they delay having pregnancy for a long time because they choose perhaps to pursue their career first. So they pursue their career in their 20s and 30s, and then in their 40s, all of a sudden they want to have a child. And, but what happened is it's now more difficult. Maybe they have tried, maybe they had gone with Western medicine, but they have had miscarriage for once or twice or more. So now what happened is that would be a great time to use herbs to help to stabilize pregnancy and prevent miscarriage. All right, so yeah, once again, there are some herbs you definitely need to avoid because of contraindication, but there are also single herbs and herbal formulas that will specifically help to alleviate complications associated with pregnancy or perhaps to even prevent miscarriage altogether. All right, so they are definitely cons and they are definitely pros. pros. All right, as far as nursing goes, obviously it's not as significant or as risky as during pregnancy because at this point in time, what happened is, you, you know, the, the baby is, we already know, know about the baby. Baby is safe, is fine, and so on. But every once in a while, the mother may have certain issues, whether it's constipation, postpartum depression, maybe infection, whatever the case may be, all right? So the idea is you try to treat the mother first with non-herbal, non-drug means, you know, maybe with acupuncture, with acupressure, with diet therapies, and so on. And in certain cases, if you have to treat with drugs or if you have to treat with herbs, if you have to use herbs, then you have to make the worst case assumption that the herbs will be become present in the breast milk and will get to the baby. And you have to ask yourself and inform the patient, are you comfortable with that? What are the effects of the herb and possible side effects of the herb? And if those herbs get to the baby, are you comfortable with that worst case scenario? Okay, so for example, if the mom is really tired because of labor and then having to wake up several times at night to feed the baby, and the mom is having a lot of qi and blood deficiency, okay, and you decide to prescribe something like four gentlemen, si jun zi tang, or four substance, si wu tang, to help to tonify qi and blood, okay, what would be the worst case scenario uh, as if the herbs do ca get passed to the baby? Well, I think in this case, probably not very much, right? Uh, tonic herb may be a little bit harder to digest. They may be a little bit clawing in nature. So maybe the baby may have a little bit of indigestion, maybe a little bit more gas. Maybe the herbs are warm. So it may cause the baby to be, I can't see it. Oh, use the pregnancy formula. <laughs> oh, it's Bao Chan Wu You Fang. Donna, can you type it in the chat room? Yeah. Okay, so if those herbs 
like I mentioned, four gentlemen or four substance get to the baby. The worst case scenario may be that the baby may have a little bit more gas, a little bit of colic because of that. Maybe uh, the herbs are warm and it's more, uh, the baby gets more restless, okay? None of those are really significant side effect and may, may or may not even happen, right? So what happened is if this is something that's going to significantly help the mom, then I would say by all means, give it to the mom. Perhaps start out with a lower dose and then gradually increase the dose and see how the patient responds. But I think in those cases, that's perfectly fine. Okay, or in, in another case, let's say the mom ends up with um, a significant infection. Okay, so now what happened is um, you don't want the infection to be passed to the infant if at all possible. Uh, you want to treat the infection because you don't want it to linger. But most of the herbs for treating infection are rather bitter and cold. So that may have more side effects for the baby. So in that case, what you might need to do or what you may choose to do is to aggressively treat the mother for a few days, maybe seven days or so. And then during that time, avoid nursing the baby. So what you can do is have the mom take a larger dose of the herb for that one week so you can treat the infection. And then during that time, just pump the milk out and dump it and have the baby take baby formulas. Okay, that way you can kind of get a little bit of both, get the benefit of both worlds where you treat the mother and you don't expose the infant to the possible risk of the herbs. And then when the infection is over, wait a day or two before they resume nursing. Okay, that way you don't have to worry about side effect of herbs in the breast milk that gets to the baby. All right, so that would be a good compromise if you decide to use herb, but you don't want to risk any side effect with the baby. All right, and lastly, and this is somewhat theoretical, is that as you consider which herb may or may not be present in the breast milk, what happens is herbs that are more lipophilic, meaning more fatty in nature, are more likely to be present in the breast milk, and herbs that are more hydrophilic, more water-soluble in nature, are less likely to be present in the breast milk. So ones that are more fatty, lipophilic in nature, are the seeds, the animal herbs type, type of things. Okay, so that's just a generic rule of thumb. Okay, but overall, still based whether to use herbs or not on the benefit versus risk uh, evaluation. And once again, if you have to, treat the mother with herbs, but during that time, uh, have the baby use the baby formula. I think that's a good reasonable compromise to use. All right, and as far as nursing goes, uh, these are some of the herbs that will help to promote lactation. So if the mother is uh, not producing enough milk, use of these herbs are going to be very, very helpful. And in addition to the herb, you can also use diet therapy as well. Uh, generally speaking, fresh fish, uh, pork feet, uh, peanuts, and also papaya. <laughs> are all great food that also help to, to increase the volume of milk production. And usually what the Chinese will do is they will cook this into a soup and then just drink that soup um, pretty much for lunch, for dinner, you know, as much as possible. And that will actually increase the production of the milk quite a bit. Okay, so that will be the key. And then in the end, when they are done with uh, nursing, then these are the herbs that will stop the lactation or terminate it. Okay, so mang xiao is to make into a herbal paste and just apply it topically. You don't need to take this orally. And the other three herbs are the ones you can take orally. Okay, so whether you use it topically or orally, generally speaking, you should be able to terminate lactation within a few days, uh, one week at most. Okay. Um, herb drug interaction is really a separate course. Uh, it's beyond what I can go over here in this class. Uh, but just to give you a rough uh, introduction, basically interaction comes down to two main concepts. One is pharmacokinetic interaction and one is pharmacodynamic interaction. Pharmacokinetics refers to the physical movement of the drug or herbs into, throughout, and out of the body specifically absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. So what happens is a lot of drugs will interact with other drugs. A lot of drugs may interact with other herbs through one of these four methods. Okay, so 
Um, this is again uh, physically when they come in contact with each other or metabolically how they uh, interact with each other's in the blood okay anyways uh, that will cause the concentration of the drug or herb to either increase or decrease and therefore increase the effect or decrease the effect okay the other is pharmacodynamic interaction and this is basically based on how the drugs work and also how the herbs work uh, if the drug and herb have similar pharmacological effect even the descriptions are completely different then chances are when they are designed to do the same thing, chances are they will have some additive, if not synergistic type of effect. And if they are designed to do the opposite thing, then chances are they will cancel the effect of each other's. So I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, the example with synergy is that, let's say if you have the patient taking anticoagulant or antipolyla drug, and one of the most common is Coumadin or maybe even Plavix. So they thin the blood basically. And then you prescribe herbal formulas that have blood-moving herbs, uh, whether it's um, Dangui, Angelica, Sinensis, Chuanxiong, Ligusticum, Taozin, Persica, Honghua, Cosmet, and so on and so forth. So our terminology is these are smooth the blood or quicken the blood or promote blood circulation. But in the end, what happened is uh, pharmac pharmacologically, they do have overlap with the drug, and when these drugs and herbs are prescribed together, chances are there is a risk of increasing bruising and also bleeding. Okay, so that will be considered a synergy because they are doing similar things. And one example of antagonism would be drug and herb that have the opposite effect. So for example, uh, ma huang ephedra has an effect to dilate the lung to treat asthma. Right, so we call that a beta agonist effect. Basically, they stimulate the lung receptors to dilate, but at the same time, they also stimulate the heart receptor and cardiovascular receptors. Okay, so chances are they will also increase heart rate and increase blood pressure. As far as the interaction goes, uh, there's a category of drugs called either the beta blockers or alpha blockers. So what these drugs do is they block the alpha or beta receptors at the cardiovascular system, and also perhaps at, at the respiratory system. And one example is uh, propranolol, indrol, right? So what happened is these drugs block the cardiovascular system receptor to bring down the blood pressure and bring down the heart rate. Okay, so they're generally used for treating hypertension. But what happened is, if you prescribe ma huang ephedra, which stimulate these receptors, along with beta blocker drugs, which block these receptors, they will basically do the opposite thing, okay? So there's a good chance that they will cancel the effect of each other's out, okay? So when that happens, ma huang doesn't work very well, and beta blockers as drugs also don't work very well. So they cancel the effect of each other's, and now what happens is drug is not doing what it's supposed to do, and the herb is not doing what it's supposed to do. So in that case, you want to avoid that type of antagonism, all right? So that's just a very quick look into what pharmacokinetic interactions is and also pharmacodynamic interaction is. If you are interested in learning more about those topics, I have done that class quite a bit. These are the links that you can click on and you can watch those archive uh, lectures uh, at the eLotus website. All right, we, I have also written article and done an introduction class on food allergies. And I think this is very important because more and more people are having more and more allergies. And this is, it's not just these eight, there's a lot of other really weird allergies, okay? But since food allergy is quite common and Chinese herbs uh, falls into the bigger umbrella of food, you know, basically in the US they are called dietary supplements. It's important to know uh, if the patient has certain food allergies, which Chinese herb would also present risk as far as cross allergy is concerned. All right, so most people may know their food allergy, but almost no patient know their Chinese herb allergy. So this is something we need to be aware of. Okay, so these are the eight main categories as far as the major food categories that are more likely to cause allergy. And one side note that I put in is a gluten. All right, so once again, I did introduction or I did a quick talk of this already on the introduction section way back about a year and a half ago. Um, and for now, I'll just leave it at that 
and I'll leave the link uh, at the bottom if you want to learn more about this topic. And if you click that link, it will bring you to the website that has the entire article and also what Chinese herb will have the cross allergy potential with the food allergy. All right. Next one that's quite important and this is quite confusing for a lot of patients and also practitioner is allergy associated with sulfur, sulfate, sulfa, and sulfite. Because a lot of time they'll come in, the patient will come in and say, or the practitioner will ask me, the patient has some sulfa or sulfate allergy and what herb do I need to avoid? Then I need to ask them specifically what they mean. Do they mean sulfur, sulfate, sulfa, or sulfite? And sometimes they don't even know. Okay, so basically the difference between all these is sulfur is simply a chemical element. It's something that naturally occurs um, pretty much everywhere and also in the human body. In fact, next to calcium and phosphorus, it's the most abundant mineral in the body. So basically it's something that's vital to the body, it's something that's present in great number in the body, and is, it is not possible to be allergic to sulfur. Okay, so that's the first one. The next one is sulfate, and sulfate is basically a sulfur atom surrounded by four oxygen atoms. Okay, so this is also something that's present in everyday life, and it's also something that does not cause allergy. So basically, don't worry about sulfur and sulfate. Sulfa, on the other hand, is quite significant. Sulfa is an abbreviation that refers to sulfonamide antimicrobials, or sulfonamide antibiotics such as sulfamethoxazole, sulfaithoxazole, um, more commonly known as Bactrim or Pediazole or Septra. Okay, so those are the brand names. So what happened is, is these are the sulfonamide antibiotics that quite a few people are in fact allergic to. Um, I don't remember the exact percentage, but it's fairly high. All right, so when the patient comes in and they say they have sulf sulfur or sulfate allergy, in most cases, they are talking about sulfonamide allergy. Okay, but nonetheless, ask them specifically, is it sulfonamide, is it pediazole, is it Bactrim, is it septra? Okay, that will give you much more information. So what happens is if they are allergic to the sulfonamide antibiotics, generally um, for the pharmacists, for the MDs, they need to avoid all the drugs within this category. Uh, for the Chinese herb, generally speaking, you should not have to worry about it, okay? Because uh, most of the herbs do not contain the same compounds. There is a small and very small chance of cross allergy, and this is not really not confirmed. It's uh, just a possibility, and that is patients that are allergic to sulfonamide and antimicrobials may have a very small chance of having allergy to ban lan gen and Da Qing Ye, which, has, which are the isatus root and isatus leaf. Okay, so that's a theoretical interaction, whether it actually happens or not. Um, I think it's, you know, uh, it's waiting to be seen. Okay, so f as of now, just keep that in mind. Okay, and lastly, uh, there's also a patient that allergic to sulfite. Sulfite is a sulfur atom surrounded by two or three oxygen atoms. Okay, sulfite is naturally occurring in some food and also during the fermentation process. Okay, and there are quite a few different food that contain sulfite. And the reason sulfite are frequently added is because they act as a natural food preservative. Okay, so you will preserve the food, give you much longer shelf life or expiration date. So these are some of the examples, including dry fruit, fruit juices, grape juice, lemon juice, lime juice, pickle, cocktail, onion, salad, sauerkraut, and also wine. Okay, so these are all the food that commonly contain sulfite. And by the way, uh, as far as the rules and regulations go, FDA allows 10 ppm amount of sulfite in food, and that's per considered perfectly safe. Okay, so unless you have severe allergy to sulfide, uh, as long as it's tested and less than 10 ppm, then it's perfectly fine. All right, these are examples of some drugs that also contain sulfide, including adrenaline, aminoglycoside, anesthetics, antifungal, corticosteroids, 
dopamine, doxycycline, and so on and so forth. Okay, and then some cosmetic products that contain sulfites, anti-aging cream, around the, around the eye creams, blush, body wash, bronzer, facial cleanser, false tan lotions, hair color, hairspray, perfumes, and skin fading lighteners. Okay, and lastly, most relevant to us, is some of the herbs that are commonly known to contain sulfite. Okay, and once again, sulfite are used in these herbs for two purposes. One is as a preservative, and the other one as a bleach to whiten uh, the herbs. So those inclu examples include Bai Guo Ginkgo Nut, Bai He Lily, Ge Gen Puaria, Gou Qi Zi Lysium, Zen Sen Ginseng, San Yao Dioscoria, Yu Zhu Polygonum, and maybe some others. All right, so once again, for the Chinese herbs, uh, if it's tested and it's less than 10 ppm, that's generally considered to meet all U.S. rules and regulations. All right, this is something regarding to uh, U.S. regulation as far as dietary supplement is concerned. So up till now, these are the three main compounds that are considered to be banned or restricted by the FDA, and they are ephedrine alkaloids, Aristolytic acid and also pyrolidazine alkaloid, and you notice I did not mention herb names, and the reason is because FDA, as a government agency, really doesn't understand herb. It understands chemical compounds. So what happened is when they determine a certain compound to be dangerous, to have unreasonable risk as a food, then they will take action to restrict it or ban it because in the end what happened is herbs are considered as dietary supplement in the u.s and as a dietary supplement or food fda's view is that it should not cause unreasonable risk risk to health okay and that's why these things happen uh, what happened in asia and also in many parts of europe uh, herbs are considered as drugs Okay, so it's given a much more balanced view as far as benef benefit and risk goes. And similarly, in those countries, herbs require a practitioner to prescribe and a pharmacy to dispense. So there's proper check and balance. But unfortunate, unfortunately, in the U.S., almost all the herbs that we have are available both through prescription and, or through practitioners and also over the counter. Uh, in fact, you can buy just about any herb on the internet. And for that reason, it's, I guess one can argue that it's not necessarily a bad idea for some of the herbs to not be so readily available to the general public because they really don't know how to use it. Anyways, uh, these are the three main classes of compounds that are restricted or banned. The first one, obviously, is Ma Huang Ephedra, okay, because Ephedra contain ephedrine alkaloids. And this is the only herb that contain ephedrine alkaloids. And FDA, basically what they have done is they have classified ephedra to not be suitable as a food, but also not suitable as a dietary supplement. Okay, but it did leave a gray area and say that Ma Huang um, may be used as by healthcare practitioners within the scope of traditional Chinese medicine. And basically what that means is if you have a practitioner that prescribe a custom formula in a decoction form and give it to the patient, the FDA is fine with that. Okay, so there is one or two herb company that still sell this as a bulk herb, but only to a prescription and only to be cooked and dispensed as a decoction. So not in any other form, not over the counter and definitely not as a diet or recreational uh, product. Okay, so that's the status of Ma Huang at this point in time. Okay, aristolytic acid, obviously there has been a lot of um, negative press and controversy and so on, but in the end what happened is there are many cases of nephropathy and also kidney cancer tied to aristolytic acid. So any herbs that belong in the genus of aristolociae is banned. Anything that contains aristolytic acid is also banned. So if you look on this slide, anything that has aristolochia in it basically are banned uh, in the U.S., in Canada, in Europe, pretty much in any developed country. 
The only herb that is still in the gray area is perhaps Xixin Asarum. Uh, what happened is historically, we use herba, parts above the ground, as a main part of the herb. But what happened is herba contains a much higher amount of erythrocytic acid. So then the part used is shifted to the root. That's why you see this now as radix and rhizoma. Our test we have done many times shows that it contains a very small trace amount of erythrocytic acid. Okay, and some tests in fact shows that it's below the detection limit. Okay, but whether it's below the detection limit or is it non-detected uh, or non-existent, that's a different question. All right, so that that's what I mean by gray area because FDA says it has a zero tolerance limit as far as erythrocytic acid is concerned. So if you have a test that can only detect to certain ppm and it's non-detected, then it does that mean it's safe or does that mean it's not legal? Okay, so we don't really know at this point. So I thought this was a dead issue, uh, but it seems like it's popping up again as far as um, whether Xixin in fact does contain a trace amount or no amount whatsoever. Um, so I guess uh, we will have to continue to wait and see. Okay, so uh, the chapter on erythrocytic acid and seasoning, I guess at this time, is not quite completely closed. All right, and the last one is pyrolidazine alkaloid. Uh, so this is an herb, or this is a compound that has been linked to possibly liver damage, especially if you consume a large amount. So originally, um, it's only comfrey in Europe that's banned because comfrey has been used quite a bit orally in Europe as a botanical medicine and it contains pyrolidazine alkaloid. Then what happened is as the FDA banned the, banned the use of pyrolidazine alkaloid, the unintended consequence is that many Chinese herbs also contain pyrolidazine alkaloid, though the FDA did not know it. So some of those herbs include zicao, anibia, Peilan, Eupatorium, Chen Li Guang, Sinensius, and others. So what happened is FDA may or may not be aware that these are the herbs that contain pyrolidazine alkaloid. But since pyrolidazine alkaloids are banned, that means these herbs should be banned as well. But they are still available um, pretty much by all the herb companies, if you want to import it, chances are the FDA inspector are not aware of this. Okay, but legally speaking, like I mentioned, these herbs do contain pyrolidazine alkaloid, have a risk for liver damage. So, legally speaking, they are illegal, they are banned. Okay, but at this time, uh, most people are still not aware of it. Okay, so I'll leave it at that. So, those are the three compounds um, that over the last 20 years or so, the FDA has specifically taken action to restrict or prohibit the use of those compounds and those herbs accordingly. All right. Then what happened is uh, as you begin to practice herb, unfortunately, we still get a lot of calls. We still get a lot of inquiries from patients about quality control issues with Chinese herbs. So I'll take the next 10, 15 minutes or so to go over some of these issues. And basically these are heavy metal issues, micro, micro, microbials or microorganisms, mycotoxins, herbicide, pesticides, CITES, non-CITES, uh, GMO, and others. All right, so generally what happened is to address all these issues, the herbal manufacturers and herbal importer herb companies have to produce what's called a certificate of analysis to address all these issues. All right, so this is what a typical certificate, certificate of analysis would look like. Basically, to identify the ER manufacturing day, analysis day, exp you know, expiration day, lot number, and all the items that are tested. Okay, so if you were to call Evergreen and ask them for the lab report of a single herb or herbal formula, this is what you would see. Uh, and same thing, you can call up any other herb companies and they should have some type of lab report to designate uh, the lab test they have done. Obviously, the test may be different from company to company, from herb to herb, because every herb have their specific, specific issues that need to be addressed. Okay, so as, as I go through different slides, 
I'll give you as many different flavors as possible so you can see what are some of the herbs, what are some of the issues, what are some of the tests that need to be done. So this one is a general uh, COA or Certificate Analysis for Huangqi Astragalus. So this first one or this first example is Guizhi Remulus Cinnamomy. So this is the cinnamon twigs. So uh, this is the first part of the test uh, describing the physical characteristic of this product. Basically, loss on drying, total ash, acid insoluble ash, diluted ethyl alcohol extract, and also water extract. So loss on drying means uh, how much water is present in the product. Okay, so what happened is for most of the herb, whether it's bulk herb or powder extract or even capsules or tablet, there's always going to be some moisture. Okay, that's inevitable. So what happened is if you take the product, you put it under a heat lamp and you dry it as much as you can, you will find out how much weight has lost and that's your loss on drying. And ideally, you want, to, want it to have as less water as possible because the water contributes to caking, it contributes to hydrolysis, and also increases the risk of caking and other issues. All right, so the product should really be dry to whatever the specification for that herb is to the lower number as low as possible, okay? Total ash and acid insoluble ash refers to the non-organic part that are present in the herb. So maybe the dirt, maybe the metals, maybe the minerals, and so on. So basically, as you burn it until it's uh, completely gone, or you dissolve it, uh, dissolve it in some type of acid, the total amount that's left at the end is basically the inorganic or you know, inactive substance. All right. So once again, you want those numbers to be as low as possible. And then uh, you're testing the solubility of the herb. Okay, so whether it's alcohol soluble or water soluble. So that test shows how much of the active ingredient you're able to extract out with water or extract out with alcohol because all herbs will have some compounds that are water soluble and also some co compounds that are alcohol soluble. Okay, so ones that tend to have more active ingredients that are soluble in alcohol primarily are the animal herbs or have the tonic herbs. And that's why if you read the classic text, a lot of the animal herbs, a lot of the tonic herbs are processed with alcohol first, either dry fried, stir fried, or soaked in liquor before they are then cooked in water for extraction. That way you get more of those active ingredients out. So the first part of these tests in COA is to establish the physical characteristic of the product. And this will help you to find the balance from one batch of raw herb to another batch to another batch. Okay, because what happened is herbs quality range widely from year to year, from province to province. All right, right now there is a huge problem with flood in China. Okay, so what happened with flood or maybe too much water? What happened is it may cause some of the herb to grow too fast or absorb too much water into the roots. So what happened is you end up with a bigger mass of herb, but perhaps not the same proportion of active ingredients. So that's not necessarily a good thing. And vice versa would be zensen ginseng. Ginseng historically grows on mountainside, crack of rocks, um, basically places where there's very little nutrients. And that's why it takes about three to five years for it to reach the ma you know, maximum uh, well, ideal uh, harvest time, okay? Because it needs that time to slowly grow and gather a lot e sufficient active compound for it to grow. But what happens is uh, if it's grown too fast, if you give it too much fertilizer, if you, you know, give it too much water, then what happens is within a year or two, instead of three to five, you will reach that same size. But what happens is you have a lot of water, you have a lot of fiber, but you don't have a lot of active ingredients. All right, so these are the physical characteristics that will give you some idea whether it's the same good quality or lesser quality as far as physical exams go. Okay, the next tests that are generally done are the heavy metals. And generally speaking, the four most important heavy metals to test are lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury. Okay, so um, the specification, which is the next column you see here, these are what the EU standards are. EU refers to European Union, European Union Pharmacopoeia. And what happened is European Union uh, standards 
is probably one of the most stringent in the whole world. And the reason is because to them, botanicals are just at the same as pharmaceutical. They are all considered as drugs. So they really do regulate herbs as drugs, basically using the exact same requirements. And that's why if you ever go to Europe, especially Switzerland and Germany, herbs are very, very expensive, just as expensive as uh, drugs. And in fact, when we sell herbs, when our distributors sell herbs in Germany, they have to jump through many hoops. Uh, what happened is they have to do with the first round of testing in Taiwan. Then we do third party testing in the US. And then as they go to Switzerland, Switzerland has to do a round of testing. And when the herbs go to Germany, Germany does not believe in any tests that are done prior to Germany. They have to require a final round of testing done by the German lab. Otherwise, it's not accepted. All right, so Germany is actually one of the most stringent countries that will not accept anybody else's ta test results. All right, so anyways, uh, these, these are the specifications established by EU. Germany, of course, falls under EU, but it, they tend to be most um, strict as far as requiring the most amount of testing. All right, and then after that, of course, is the uh, test results and also the testing methods. All right, so these are the heavy metal tests that are done. Okay, and ND, of course, means non detected, and what the results are. And this is for an herb, Gan Chao uh, licorice. Okay, and then these are the tests for microbials. Okay, so these are the main microbes that are tested. Okay, so you have the aerobic microbial count, total yeast and mold, gram negative E. coli and also salmonella, okay? And generally speaking, if you are getting the herbal extract, this should not be an issue. And the reason is because herbs are cooked at boiling temperature before they are extracted. So generally speaking, microbial is a piece of cake. You know, they should all pass. Uh, if you are using the raw herbs, uh, then this becomes a much bigger issue. So for example, if you buy raw herbs, or if you buy a product that if you were to dissolve it in water and feel, feel the, the herb, if it feels like there's a lot of fibrous particles, well, chances are it's a ground herb pressed into tablet or encapsulated product. And what happened with um, powder herb is that it tends to have a lot more issues with microbials, and it also tends to have a lot more issues with the physical testing, you know, meaning the acid insoluble ash and total ash content, because those would have much higher fiber, dirt, you know, non-organic components. All right, so um, the raw herb powder product tend to be a lot less expensive, but then potentially may have those issues, especially the microbes. Okay, these are the next ones are the mycotoxins, and uh, mycotoxins are the byproducts produced by the yeast and the fungus. Okay, so what happens is if the herb, when it's harvested, is not properly stored. Okay, meaning they leave it out to sun dry, or maybe during the sun drying process, it rains, right? So then the herb got moist, and then the herb starts to grow fungus and mold. And then the fungus and mold will pr produce byproducts called aflatoxin and okra toxin. And they are toxic to the liver and also toxic to the kidney. So these are the things that must be tested to make sure uh, there were no problems with mycotoxins. And this is also something that occur quite, quite a bit with all the uh, produce, specifically peanuts or, or you know, seeds in nature. Anyways, um, for aflatoxin, we need to test for total aflatoxin and also aflatoxin B1. The US standard is less than 20 ppb total. The industry standard is 20 and 5, so 20 for aflatoxin and 5 for aflatoxin B1. And the European standard is the most strict, which would be four and two. So in this case, this is for Go Cheats Lyceum Fruit. Uh, for this particular batch, the result is ND, non-detected. And then for okra toxin, uh, it should be less than 10 ppb. And then in this case, it's also ND. Okay, okra toxin tends to occur a lot more in grapes, raisin, grapefruit, and so on. And also the seeds type of Chinese herb as well. Okay. And then uh, this is for herbicide and pesticides. And once again, uh, different herbicide and, and pesticides are used for different crops. Okay, so this is going to be somewhat of a uh, um, mouse catching rats, 
rats type of scenario. You want to know the herb, you want to know what the farmers do, you know, want to know what herbicide or pesticide they use, if any. So the more you know about the farms and the farmer and what they do, the more effective your testing will be. All right. So generally speaking with Zensen ginseng, uh, quintazine tends to be the one that's used the most. It's a fungicide. All right, so uh, this is something that has to be tested each and every time uh, to make sure it doesn't have any. So for Zensen ginseng, Korean ginseng, Chinese ginseng, and also American ginseng, quintazine is the most important test to run. All right, and lastly, this is an herb called Gergen puaria. And Gergen, uh, generally speaking, if it looks too white, then there is a chance that it's been treated with sulfide or sulfur dioxide. Okay, so once again, sulfur dioxide is used both to bleach and also to preserve the herb. Okay, so gun generally is tested. It has to be less than 10 ppm uh, to meet the FDA standards. All right, so those are examples with single herbs. Uh, we do the exact same with the herbal formulas. Generally speaking, with the herbal formulas, um, obviously you want to test a single herb first, right? So if a single herb pass, then you put it into the formula. You don't want to do it the other way around. And if you do it the other way around, then what happens is you put all the herb into a big giant container, you cook it, extract it, then you do a final test. And then what happens is if the final test fail, then everything has to be thrown out because it did not pass. All right, so generally speaking, if all the individual herbs pass, the formula will have no problem. But nonetheless, the same test had to be run anyways. So this is what it looks like for the formula. And in addition to all the tests that we mentioned already, they have to do a TLC, which is an identity test for all the ingredients in the formula. So TLC stands for thin layer chromatography. So this is what's called the footprint of the herb. All right, so you will leave different trails of size and color when you put it, put it on this plate. All right, so these are all the herbs okay, that are used in Xiaoqing Long Tang, and then the TLC plate that shows the herb. And as far as the U.S. is confirmed, we also need to do two additional tests. One of them is ephedrine alkaloids, and as you can see here, everything is ND. Basically, we have to show that Ma Huang was not used in, the, in this formula, because the classic formula contains Ma Huang, but in the U.S. it's no longer allowed, so we have to take it out. And not only do we have to take it out, we have to show through lab tests that it doesn't have any FHR and alkaloids. And then the other is Xiaoqing Long Tang historically also consider contains Xi Xin. So obviously that has to be taken out as well and then follow with a lab test that shows non-detective for silicic acid. All right. So in addition to those standard tests, we also have to show CITES permit. If any of the protected plants or protected animals are to be imported. So, this is what a CITES permit looks like. And this is a CITES plan or permit for Muxiang Sasaria, for Goji Spadium, and also for Tianma Gastrodia. Okay, so we have to show this permit before we can import them to the US. And if we export somewhere else, then we have to show a export permit for the CITES permit. And they are some herbs that can easily be confused, okay? Meaning this, um, like, we, we use ch turtles in Chinese medicine, right? So some of the turtles are endangered, some of the turtles are farmed, and they are perfectly fine. But obviously, once you make them into granules, you can no longer tell which one is which. So this is a non cities permit uh, certificate to show that the origin is from a farm turtle called the reef turtle, and it's not poached from the wild. So this is what's called a non cites permit certificate. All right, we as we make the herbs, we use a non-GMO corn starch and non-GMO potato starch as the excipient for the herbs. Okay, so this is our lab test that tests the DNA of the starch to show that this is a non-GMO starch. So this is a lab test and also the lab results. Okay. A few years ago, we also got a lot, got a lot of inquiries uh, from the animal rights activists, whether the herbs, specifically the donkeys, were human, hum, humanely raised. Uh, so we um, um, inquired all the way back to the manufacturer, to the importer, and also to the farmer. 
uh, to get an idea of how the donkeys were farmed. And these are the feedback that we got. So this is the donkey farm where they are feed and where they lived, okay, along with all the business permit, the veterinary permit, and the farming permits. All right, so these are the results that we got, got you know, basically all the permits along with the farming conditions of the donkey. So in case if you got the same inquiry, in, in case you were curious, this is what they are. All right. And then in addition to all the tests that are done for the raw material, for the intermediate product, for the finished product, we also do a lot of third party tests here in the US, um, basically to verify what was done by the importer, what was done by the manufacturer, and is in fact uh, accurate results. All right, so this is an example of um, uh, ascophyllum kelp. Uh, so what happened is the kelp that come from the oceans near China, unfortunately are all too polluted. Um, part of the reason is because China has gone through incredible industrial revolution over the last 20, 30 years. And one of the byproduct of industrial revolution is the land, the water, and the ocean become more polluted. You know, so the haizhou, kelp, is no longer acceptable. So we end up sourcing haizhou from the northern Canada, from the um, northern part of Europe. And those tends to be much cleaner. And then after we source them from over there, we got the lab test from the manufacturer. We also sent it out for third party lab to make sure arsenic, or in this case, the inorganic arsenic is less than two ppm, you know, and that's the main criteria. So this is a th third party test that we did to make sure that it's safe. Another issue that comes up quite a bit the last two years is with asbestos and the baby powder with Johnson & Johnson. So we knew about this issue for a long time, and as far as Chinese earth goes, the issue would be with hua si, which is talcum, okay? So generally speaking, what happened is the, the baby powder, of course, is a commercial product or a retail product. The talcum is a pharmaceutical product, so you would think this is not an issue, but nonetheless, we were asked, and we have been testing this for every, each and every batch for the last two years or so. Okay, so the herbs are tested to make sure there's no asbestos uh, inside the hua si, not only for the single herb, but also for all the herbal formulas uh, that contain this ingredient. So as you can see here, uh, we usually send in quite a few items at a time for the lab test. So this is uh, for hua si, for Herbal DRX for V support for Ba Zheng San and Zhu Ling Tang and so on. So, like I mentioned, for all the single herbs and all the herbal formulas. And then more recently, um, uh, hemp became very popular and also legal in many uh, states. So, what happened is uh, with the popularity come with more scrutiny. So, historically, when we import Ma Zhen, uh, hemp seed, we just have to show that it's in powder form, it's not in seed form, it cannot be planted and grown, and that's it. But now, we go one step further to make sure the seed is only the seed, it doesn't contain any THC, so it's not going to be habit forming, it's not going to have any, uh, you know, any effect on the central nervous system. All right, so we send the single herb and also all the formula that contain ma zi and the hemp seed to make sure there's no THC. So once again, this is a third party lab test for that purpose, okay? Here are more lab tests and this is for the heavy metals, okay? So this is done by Mid Midwest Laboratories, testing single herbs uh, for heavy metals, mercury, lead, cadmium, and also arsenic, okay? So they all have to meet the standards. And this is a third party lab test for herbicide and pesticides. So like I mentioned, with Zensen, the main one to be tested is called quintazine because that's what the farmer used the most. And then what we also do is we send it out to third-party lab, third-party tests to screen for many, many other herbicides and pesticides that may be intentionally or in unintentionally present in the herb. All right, so in this case, you can, you can see there are many, many other herbicide and pesticides that are tested all right, so it's not just one or two. In fact, it's quite a long screen. So this next part is that is to show you that with all the tests that we have done 
every once in a while we do have an OMG moment and that OMG moment is OOS. OOS, the industrial term is out of spec, meaning with all the tests that we've done, every once in a while you will find herbs that are out of spec. Maybe um, the manufacturer did a test but it's inaccurate and we found out over here or we're testing the raw material here and it doesn't pass. But in any case, what happened is when it doesn't pass, then there's only one way to, uh, there, there are actually two ways to solve the problem. One is we'll contact the manufacturer and we tell them, you know, it failed. What, what would you like us to do? And the two option is one, to destroy it here in the US, or two, uh, if you want it back, then you can have it back, but we're not gonna keep it, we're not gonna use it. So basically we send it back and ask for a refund. Okay, so those are uh, what happens when the earth fail the test. And in fact, over the years, we have had many examples of herbs that fail the test. And as a result, I think we have the, the biggest love-hate relationship with all the suppliers in Taiwan. And the reason is because they love to do business with us because we do purchase quite a, few, a large number of herbs and we are willing to pay the high price for quality herbs. But at the same time, many of them hate us because we send back quite a bit of herbs or we destroy quite a bit of herbs for, for all the ones that don't, that don't pass the lab test. Okay, so these are some of the lab tests that are, I'm happy to show you that actually fail. So this is herbal ABX and the, the one that failed is arsenic. Okay, so arsenic level is too high. It's 4.17 ppm. And the one, the highest amount we can accept is 2 ppm. Okay, so it's uh, quite a bit over. And this particular one has to be destroyed. All right, this is a single herb called Puyin. And this is for cadmium. Okay, so once again, it's too high. It's 0.48, so it has to be destroyed as well. Okay, this is for a product called Penelia Complex. Um, the lead is too high. Lead is over seven ppm. Uh, we will take no, no higher than five. That's the EU standards. This is for Corydalin. So this is um, specifically testing for aflatoxin for Yan Hu Suo. Yan Hu Suo is a very hard herb to handle because um, it's generally harvested at the same time as a rainy season. So what happened is as soon as it's harvested, it needs to be dried and stored and kept dried as much as possible. But what makes it difficult is in poor parts of China, as they harvest this, they usually sun dry the herb. They don't have large size industrial oven to dry the herb. So what happens is as they harvest it, they will sun dry it. If it rains, they will bring it in house. Okay, but by that time it's too late. You know, once the herb gets wet, it's going to grow fungus and mold. Okay, and even if they remove the fungus and mold later, um, it will still have aflatoxin. Alpha, okay, so for a long time, we were having a lot of trouble sourcing Yan Hu Suo Corridalis with minimal amount of aflatoxin, ones that meet the EU standard, which is 4 and 2 ppb. So in this case, uh, the aflatoxin B1 is too high. It's about 8.5. So this is rejected. There's no way we can use this. And then this is also rejected. This is actually not our product. So I remember during that time, what happened was we could not buy any um, qualified raw material for Yan Hu Suo Corridalis. And then it was still available, okay? Um, everybody was still selling it. So we went out, bought a whole bunch of samples to test, and we found out that, well, it's just the same. Everybody else's product is too high. But what happened is they actually meet the U.S. standard. Remember, FDA standard is 20 ppb. So they actually could be imported and sold in the U.S. It's perfectly legal. It's just that for us, we will not accept it. Okay, so this is another product. It's 15.7. So once again, it meets the U.S. standards for 20 ppb total, but it's just too high for us. Okay, this is another sample product from the market. It's 15.4, a little bit lower, but once again, much, much too high. It really should be two or less. All right, and this is another uh, test that we've done. This is for Xiaoqing Long Tang, minor popularum combination, right? So what happened is we buy this from Taiwan. We specifically instruct them to not use Ma Huang Ephedra and also Xi Xin um, uh, Asarum. But what happened is when we buy the herb, we test every time for Xi Xin or for Ursulic acid. So in this case, it's not present. 
but when we test for a feature alkaloid, we actually found pre found it to be present. So we asked the supplier and asked them what happened, and in the end, what happened was they tried to improve efficiency by producing all the different batches of Xiao Cai Hutang at the same time. So what happened was they produced their domestic batch of Xiao Cai Hutang or Xiao Qing Long Tang first. So after they finished with the domestic batch, they then produced the custom batch for the United States. And what happened was um, there is a residue, there's some residue left of the solution in the container in the tube somewhere in the manufacturing uh, equipment. So as they make Xiao Qing Long Tang for the US, what happened is there's some effervescent alkaloid that were left in there. Then we found out through the lab test. Xi Xin, erythrolytic acid wasn't present because it was very low to start with, so we did not find any. Anyhow, the bottom line is um, they thought they followed all the proper um, manufacturing steps, but we only found out because we did all the tests. Okay, so when something like this happened, once again, basically we had to destroy it because uh, the manufacturer did not want it back, and I'm glad it did not want it back because if this goes back to Taiwan, it also is a different formulation, right? In Taiwan, they can use Ma Huang, that's perfectly fine. In fact, they would want to have Ma Huang in their formulation. But they say, basically, we come to an agreement that just, just destroyed the United States, which is what we did. They make another batch, they bring it to the U.S., and then it passed. Once again, uh, did not have ephedrine alkaloids. You know, so uh, this, like I mentioned, is the OMG moment, and it happens every once in a while, and that's why our suppliers in Taiwan and also in China, they love us, and they also hate, hate us all at the same time. All right, so that basically is to give you an inside look what inside look as to what the life at, at a herb company look like, all right? So if your patients have questions about quality control, about certain lab tests, uh, feel free to send us an inquiry. Uh, we'll be more than happy to give you these lab test results. So you can see it, you can give it to the patient. We have it for each and every batch of the herb. Um, there is no exception for the lab test. And for the patients, you know, these lab tests may not mean anything because it's too technical. Um, so you can show it to them if you like, or we also have the more patient-friendly brochures that you can pass it over to them. Okay, so we have these brochures. They are also downloadable uh, on the internet. So you can click on the link and you can see it, see it, download it. You can email it to the patient and so on. Okay, so hopefully that'll make your job easier to prescribe herb. Hopefully it'll give you and also the patient more peace of mind as they take the herbs. All right, and these are the links specifically for the quality control overview. All right, so I think the purpose of this is hopefully to educate uh, the practitioner, which is you, and also all the patients, not just about one particular company's product, but about all the herb companies, you know, because um, regardless of what herb company you use, regardless of what product you use, these are the same issue that face everybody, that face the entire industry. All right, so wh regardless of what you use, whether it's raw herb, whether there's tablets or tinctures and so on, you need to be aware of these issues and you need to, uh, once in a while, put the herb supplier in a tough spot. You know, make sure they are doing their homework, make sure they are doing their job so you can do your job, okay? And that's why uh, having some of this inside information I think is very helpful, all right? So hopefully uh, that gives you an idea in the last 14, 15 classes or so of some introductory knowledge of what you need to know as a practitioner on how to use herb effectively and at the same time, uh, how not to get yourself in trouble when not to treat the patient. Basically in last, last class today, some information about, um, I guess a little bit of everything uh, that you need to know or should know, all right? And once again, my uh, emails, my doors are always open. So if, if at any time you have questions, feel free to give me a call, send me an email. I'll be more than happy to answer whatever question you have. All right, so thank you very much. And I hope to see you again at, a, at some point in time. Well, like I mentioned, Ma Huang in the US, FDA's um, specific or gray area re requirement is that it can only be through a practitioner in a custom formula in an herbal decoction, 
Okay, so really no other way. And Camo Camo Herbs uh, in New York is the only company I know that import Ma Huang that cook it um, following the order of a prescription and they'll send the decoction to you or the patient. Okay, so if you still want to prescribe it, for example, you know, because you need to write a herbal decoction prescription for COVID-19 or somebody with asthma, whatever the case may be, they are able to take that herbal prescription and they are able to compound it, cook it, and send it to your patient. Okay, so if you want to use it, that's, that's who you can contact and get it filled. And you can also contact the, uh, well actually in fact the, the owner of the herb company is Thomas Leon. He is both a pharmacist and also a TCM practitioner. Okay, so uh, yeah, so he runs a great company and they, they offer great service. All right. All right, thank you guys for all attending today's webinar. And today's class has been recorded, so if you'd like to watch it again, you can log into your eLotus account and find it in your in our TC and Wisdom Tube tomorrow afternoon, or you can also check our YouTube page. That's it for today. And again, if you today is the last day, the last webinar of Dr. Chen's intro to Chinese herb series and it has been approved the whole series has been approved for CEUs it's 13 CEUs total I'll share the link with you in the chat room and you can check it out all right guys thank you so much and have a great rest of your day bye